Well, thank you all so much uh, for the kind introduction and the invitation to speak uh, at the symposium this morning. It's a great pleasure. Um, again, um, in, in the short time that we have, uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about rabies prevention and control. And again, some of the information uh, was, was very aptly introduced um, in Jesse's talk, and we'll, we'll uh, talk a little bit more uh, about the frame around rabies prevention and control. So um, in the short time we have here this morning, uh, here's the objectives of, of our session. We're gonna look at what is the target of, our, of rabies prevention in general, and how rabies epidemiology actually helps us hit that target, improves our aim so that we actually are hitting the target, and then we'll talk a little bit about rabies prevention strategies, both from kind of a 10,000 foot view, kind of a more general or global uh, holistic perspective about rabies prevention, and then kind of a ground level view for some of the prevention activities, uh, again, that we deal with every day in a state health department in Georgia, uh, and uh, tell you a little bit about how, how we try to get the word out about those prevention strategies. And then we'll talk just very, very briefly about uh, some prevention for actually only one of, of uh, rabies new tricks. I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Vora tell you about another major new trick later today, so I'll tease that for you. So in any case, we, we hear about, and, and in Jesse's talk he said the same way, rabies is a preventable viral disease. You can see on the CDC website. And again, how, uh, rabies in humans is 100% preventable through uh, appropriate medical care, et cetera. So, so obviously the concept of prevention is core uh, to how we approach uh, uh, rabies. But what really is our prevention target? And if we're really gonna hit the bullseye here, really the ultimate target is to prevent human rabies cases, at least from a public health standpoint. Uh, so from our, for our mission, really the prevention activities that we undertake uh, with a variety of different partners, our goal is ultimately to prevent human rabies cases. But how do we improve our aim? Uh, how do we actually hit this target? And really, again, you'll hear the, the foundation, the mantra of this talk really will be that the success of any disease containment strategy must be founded upon epidemiology and surveillance. So in order to hit that rabies prevention target, we have to have core animal and human rabies surveillance mechanisms in place that are going to be able to guide and target uh, again, our interventions and our control measures to again ultimately prevent human rabies cases. So again, um, if we think about rabies epidemiology, uh, again, as we know, really understanding rabies epidemiology and you got an appreciation for how the epidemiology changes over time, uh, again, uh, with both host factors and, again, uh, factors of the virus itself, understanding the epidemiology of rabies in a given area really is the foundation for how we recognize risk factors and then how we subsequently control them. So clearly there will be different prevention strategies when we're talking about a developing country, when we're talking about worldwide, and we're talking about the United States or even in a rural area within a state you know, such as in, in Georgia, for example. So again, I'm not going to uh, reiterate a lot of what Jesse talked about, but again, I'm just gonna highlight the main points. So when we're thinking about using epidemiology to drive and target our prevention, clearly when we think about rabies epidemiology worldwide, we're talking about dog. Absolutely, you've heard that before. Um, and you realize that human rabies clearly is a huge, huge public health issue around the world. Uh, again, as, as Jesse had mentioned, more than 55,000 human rabies cases around the world. And we're really talking about, again, the primary exposures and the primary animal reservoir is uh, canine rabies worldwide. And when we think about in the U.S., it's primarily a wildlife disease. Dog rabies transmission has been eliminated, but in, in here in the U.S., we primarily have wildlife reservoirs with uh, a subsequent domestic animal and human spillover infections. So our wildlife hosts uh, or reservoirs that, that you saw in the previous talk obviously include raccoons, skunks, foxes, mongooses, and bats. 
And uh, human rabies is, is relatively uncommon here in the US um, and most often associated with either bad exposures or uh, international dog exposures, exposures to dogs abroad or in other ways as well. So when we're thinking about focusing on prevention for, for human rabies in the US, where you know, what we really have to worry about are bad exposures or uh, international dog exposures. Easy, I like to use cartoons to make a point. Um, so let's think about how we're going to use that epidemiology, those, just those core patterns, to drive our prevention. So let's start worldwide, and let's start with really just a global 10,000-foot view of how we approach rabies uh, prevention. Clearly, it's the, it's the holistic way to look at it is really to create that barrier between uh, animal rabies and people. And it involves a variety of, again, high-level... Um, components, including people, ongoing research, education, vaccination, improving access to treatment uh, around the world, and, and at its core, diagnostic surveillance in animals. Um, so again, really, uh, again, the way to approach it that has had a tremendous amount of success. I'm sure many of you are familiar with World Rabies Day uh, that has been, uh, again, uh, instituted since 2007. And again, the Global Alliance for Rabies Control, these multidisciplinary partnerships that really form international advocacy um, agendas and really effective blueprints for control. It's been a major game changer. And again, from that 10,000 foot view, it's, a, it's, it's uh, again, uh, a very appropriate strategy. Clearly, uh, again, not a single area or developing country can do it alone, um, but again, has these resources available. So that's the kind of global 10,000 foot view. Now let's just take a little uh, a look at prevention strategies kind of on a day-to-day, ground-level basis uh, that we deal with in the U.S. in a state health department. And you'll see that rabies prevention really is tiered. It's got a variety of building blocks that you can see here. Uh, you can't have rabies prevention with, you know, without, without all of these um, tiers to make up this. And really the foundation that holds it all together, this, this pole here, is what? Animal and human rabies surveillance. That's what holds it together. So all prevention strategies are going to be driven by and guided by surveillance activities. So what we'll do in the talk is we'll just talk a little bit about some of these uh, building block components of, of, of prevention, uh, some of them in a little more detail than others. Uh, and again, some of them were, will be covered in some of the other talks in more detail, and some were even covered in Jesse. So let's take a look, first of all, at animal and human rabies surveillance. I'll just give you one example, uh, Georgia example, of how we use uh, surveillance data and uh, animal rabies uh, surveillance data to, to guide uh, and inform our prevention activities. So this map really just shows you, again, uh, if, we, if we map out and look at um, animal rabies cases, this is in one, uh, this is in South Georgia, in our, what we call our Waycross district in, in Southeast Georgia. And if we look at kind of mapping out the number of rabies cases, they're all raccoon, you know, as you can see here, but uh, mostly all raccoon. But if you kind of look at these sort of uh, hot spots of locations, it's a very rural, uh, again, area in Georgia. So clearly, you know, some of this is really going to reflect where some of the higher, higher population uh, centers are, although they're still not very high population by any means. But it helps us identify locations at risk, and it helps our local health departments sort of target their um, uh, domestic animal vaccination clinics that they sponsor in partnership with veterinary clinics and also educational campaigns kind of in these areas where they see the most cases. You know, again, not anything, again, that, that uh, uh, should be all that earth shattering, but really, uh, again, using surveillance to drive and allocate resources for prevention, especially in an area like this. So, so now let's take a look at the next prevention strategy, just briefly, one of the building blocks. Let's look at domestic animal vaccination. Um, and again, for us, the way that I'm going to approach some of these, uh, these slides, uh, again, we do a, an awful lot of education uh, at the state health department level for all of the partners involved in rabies control. So again, a lot of the time, so again, what, what we try to uh, do is this kind of outreach to veterinarians, to local health departments, to our Georgia Poison Center, 
who again assists us with taking uh, uh, rabies questions and rabies calls. So in any case, let's talk just a little bit about um, you know, how we approach education about domestic animal vaccination. Again, clearly this is you know, pre-exposure for them uh, and really again forms the, the key barrier between wildlife rabies uh, in the U.S. And, and people. So in Georgia, by law, all dogs and cats and ferrets, for that matter, um, uh, must be vaccinated against rabies. Uh, that's the, the OCGA uh, statute that you see there that, again, just tells you what, what law it falls under. And again, uh, depending on, on uh, the, the vaccine and the vaccine label, again, typically uh, these animals are vaccinated at three months of age. Some vaccines are licensed to be used in younger animals. And then they are boosted either, uh, they're boosted definitely a year later and then either annually or, or triennially, depending on if it's a one year or three year rabies vaccine. Uh, we also uh, promote that valuable livestock or livestock that, again, uh, are uh, involved with frequent contact with people, livestock shows, uh, on display. You'll hear a, a nice story from Dr. Gobble later about how this could go wrong. We, we, we recommend that those animals uh, remain uh, vaccinated against rabies. And we consider an animal to be currently vaccinated if the rabies vaccine was given at least 28 days uh, prior uh, and was administered properly. Uh, one thing that we, we um, offer, you know, again, as far as a lot of education, we get a lot of questions about how to use or whether it's appropriate to use uh, rabies antibody, anti-rabies antibody titers in animals for management um, as far as their immune status. And we spend a lot of time, again, educating veterinarians and pet owners and others involved in rabies management, animal control issues, that titers really should not be used uh, again, uh, to determine the immediate immune status, you know, again, of, of a dog, cat, or ferret, for that matter. Um, again, there are, there are more than just the humoral immunity involved. Uh, there is not really a kind of hot, a, a exact number where the titer is equal to a level of protection. There's cellular immunity and other immunity, as well, in, and titers do wane over time. So again, we, we educate our folks not to, uh, not to use uh, titers to determine whether or not uh, the dog who may have an allergic reaction to, to uh, its last rabies shot, whether it can get another one, whether it's considered to be immune. Again, uh, that is not the way to do that. So let's take a look at, just briefly, without a whole lot of detail, the, one of the other building blocks in rabies prevention, and that is appropriate animal management uh, of, of animals that have either been ex potentially exposed to rabies by wildlife or other, uh, or other uh, vectors, uh, or, whether, um, or animals that bite humans. So uh, if we take a look at, again, the sort of recommended management, and all of these, again, all of these uh, uh, recommendations are part of our national recommendations, the National Compendium for Animal Rabies and Control uh, that is, again, adopted in, in, in practice most everywhere around the United States. So in any case, if we think about how we usually approach domestic animals in Georgia that are exposed to uh, rabies or potentially exposed to them by a wild animal, um, again, uh, when we think about uh, one question that we get a lot, uh, really the wild animal is really going to be the highest risk, clearly, when we think about the epidemiology. But we get a lot of questions about whether or not, you know, again, uh, a dog-to-dog -dog encounter or a cat fight, uh, again, uh, may in fact um, necessitate some sort of management of that animal to observe it uh, for signs of rabies. And we really don't consider that to be a high risk. Uh, again, typically these, these encounters, you know, again, uh, when we look at, at the number of dog rabies cases, the number of cat rabies cases, even in Georgia, again, uh, if, unless these animals, if these animals are otherwise healthy and are behaving in a way, uh, again, that it seems to be normal within the realm of why they would be having this kind of fight or this encounter, uh, again, uh, provoked, if you will, uh, you know, we don't consider it to be, you know, a management where we need to actually observe the animal for signs of rabies. But we do get a question about that uh, quite often. So let's take a look a little bit at uh, domestic animals that are exposed to uh, rabies, primarily from wildlife, not from domestic. Um, uh, that's my cat, E.T. Um, <laughs> He's hairless, but he, so that's why he wears, has to wear a sweater at all times. But um, he is vaccinated. But if, if he weren't, um, 
If he were exposed to a wild animal, uh, again, a, 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 wild, a, a rabies vector, a raccoon, it, either, either, again, one that has tested positive for rabies or one that we assume uh, would be rabid if we ha don't have it available uh, for testing, such as a raccoon. Again, for unvaccinated dogs and cats, we either consider uh, euthanasia or a six-month uh, strict isolation period with the appropriate uh, vaccination, either, uh, either upon entry uh, to the six month isolation period or, or at month five so that they're current when they come out of the isolation period. And what we find, you know, kind of in practice, uh, at least in Georgia, from uh, local animal control agencies and local uh, health department environmental health folks is that, again, there are a variety of ways that this is accomplished in practice uh, as far as the actual isolation itself. It used to be in Georgia that it was mandated that there was a specific size of pen uh, with a cement floor and a certain height of, of double barrier uh, kind of wall fence around, around the pen. Um, but now we see um, that um, isolations that again, that again, obviously this isolation period would approximate the incubation period of, of rabies. So we're trying to, do, to monitor this animal to see if it goes to, on to develop signs and symptoms of rabies so that it's in one place, we know where it is, that it hasn't escaped, gotten loose, and potentially exposed other animals or people. Um, but again, in practice, we see isolations actually um, administered in a variety of ways. Uh, again, in veterinary clinics, in other types of pens, and uh, our local health departments work, work closely with the owners of the animals to try to accomplish this. It's easy if, if, um, if the animal is already vaccinated, like ET. Um, if he were exposed to a raccoon, then all we would have to do is give him a booster dose of rabies vaccine and monitor him, him at home, uh, kind of normally, for a 45-day period, just to ensure that, in, in fact, um, even though we assume that, again, uh, his, his rabies biologics are going to be you know, highly potent, highly immunogenic, he should be good to go, especially with the anamnestic response of that booster dose of vaccine, but just in case, uh, for whatever reason, we're going to monitor him at home uh, and recommend to the owners that they don't, you know, kind of get rid of the animal, give it to somebody else at that time, um, during that time frame at all. And so what we also get a qu lots of questions about um, health department wise is, what if my dog or cat has a quote unquote expired vaccine that maybe expired a day, a month, a week? It varies, maybe longer than that. Um, and again, as you know, um, you know, as, as, as talking about biology, you know, right on that exactly that one year or three year period on that given day, um, you know, the immunity just doesn't stop. Um, it can vary. Um, so in any case, we, we really consider that on a case by case basis. For, the, for, for animals that have, you know, kind of very recently out of date uh, vaccinations, you know, we, we, we consider them current really. Um, but again, we, we recommend that they consult with us at the health department and we walk them through that as well. Livestock um, that get exposed to rabid animals, uh, again, we really kind of do the same, the same kind of thing. If it's vaccinated, we revaccinate and observe. Uh, if unvaccinated, we either euthanize or put it under a six month you know, kind of isolation so that we can approximate, again, the incubation period of rabies as well. So again, nothing all that new under the sun. Um, so that, that's how we manage primarily you know, kind of domestic animals that are exposed to wildlife rabies. But what about animals that bite humans? Uh, and again, we'll just talk a little bit about uh, both, again, uh, domestic animals at first and, the, and then others as well. So if a dog, a cat, or a ferret bites a human. Um, again, the recommendation is that they need to be observed for a period of 10 days, regardless of their vaccination status, whether they're current or not current. If they have the animal and someone, they need to be observed for a 10-day period. So this is going to approximate not the incubation period, but the sh viral shedding period of rabies, right? So this, again, if we consider the bite to be a potential sign or aggression, a sign of rabies, clinical sign, then over this 10-day period, we would expect the animal to go on to develop um, worsening clinical signs, uh, neurologic signs, and then would be uh, at that first sign of illness would be tested for rabies at that point in time. So again, 10-day observation uh, upon a bite. And again, we, do, we don't recommend that they administer rabies vaccine during this 10-day period. Um, and again, there are not a lot of data, again, to show uh, that it really it, like lengthens that shedding period or anything like that. But again, it, uh, the, the theory really is in a practical sense that if the animal has some sort of a 
uh, a clinical or adverse reaction to the vaccine itself for some reason, it may be difficult to distinguish it from you know, a clinical sign of rabies or at least the prodromal type of clinical sign. So that's, that's the reason we recommend that if it's not fixed. Um, and as far as, we get a lot of questions, at least in Georgia, about, you know, kind of livestock that bite humans, primar primarily horses in, in various settings. We don't consider them to be high risk, but in any case, um, most of the time, uh, if, if the animal is, again, showing signs suggestive of rabies, um, we, we might consider on a case-by-case -case basis looking at euthanasia and testing. Otherwise, we really just monitor it for a 45-day period or... or, or uh, or so. Sometimes that varies a little bit too. Um, if when we're thinking about really the high risk, the high risk animals that bite humans obviously are the the uh, wildlife reservoirs, the wild carnivores, raccoons, skunks, foxes. Again, they are high risk. All bites uh, are are considered possible exposures to rabies. They should be euthanized and tested if available. Many times this is not the case, um, but most of the time. Um, we then just consider it to be an exposure. And bats the same way, any possible exposure at all. Uh, as as uh, Jesse had mentioned, when we look at the epidemiology of human rabies in the US, um, again, many of the bat exposures have been what what can be in some cases termed cryptic, where there may not have been um, an obvious bite situation, but there may have been physical contact with a bat, or there may not be a physical bite you know, that's visible, but we consider that to be uh, uh, that, again, there, there may be bites that do take place, but they just are not um, uh, visible. So we consider that to be a high risk. And last but not least, uh, again, we don't consider rodents and lagomorphs to be uh, of high risk, but we do get a lot of questions about, again, um, human bites uh, involving squirrels um, and you know, mice, rats, so for us in Georgia, there are situations where, again, the animal may be behaving ab uh, abnormally, very or again, there may be other circumstances that sort of warrant testing. But usually we recommend that, that again, we sort of approve that testing before they send it to our public health laboratory. Um, otherwise, our public health laboratory would be overrun with a number of you know, rats and mice that bite people all the time and squirrels. Uh, so again, we sort of monitor that b based on risk itself. So those are kind of the most of the uh, general categories of animals that bite humans that we are concerned about. But camels might pose a slightly different <laughs> Just a joke. All right. So in any case, let's talk a little bit about one of the other tiers of rabies prevention. And I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail here. Jesse talked a little bit about pre and post exposure prophylaxis. But two of these tiers go together. And again and again, it's founded on the, the risk factors and epidemiology of rabies in an area. But really, um, conducting appropriate risk assessment in conjunction with deciding, you know, again, whether uh, post exposure prophylaxis as a prevention strategy is appropriate in, in these situations. So these two go together. And again, when we talk about risk assessment, we really consider, uh, again, a variety of situations, a variety of components, as again, whether uh, the, it was a bite versus a non-bite exposure, the type of animal, the vaccination status of the animal, uh, whether we have the animal available for testing, and you know, kind of the circumstances of exposure. One thing that I know anybody in this room who has dealt with rabies questions and dealt with rabies, uh, you know, inquiries and calls, you realize that that rabies risk assessments oftentimes are uh, almost never, you know, kind of very clearly black or white. There's a lot of gray and there's a lot of variables, and that's why uh, again, risk assessment is again something that is is appropriately done. Uh, you know, with a lot of experience, and you, you get you get pretty good at it. But most of the time, they're not black or white. Although some some situations really might be pretty black or white. For example, if you have raccoon living in your vinyl couch, um, that that's a that's a no no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a let's take a, a look at again just briefly 
uh, how we go about, you know, again, uh, doing a risk assessment for recommending a post-exposure prophylaxis for a potential rabies exposure. And again, for us in Georgia, we have you know, sort of algorithms that, that again uh, are mirror the national recommendations. And we really, our algorithms that are used, we really just kind of classify animals based on, again, epidemiology of rabies into either very low, low, intermediate, or high risk categories. So again, uh, again, nothing all that new under the sun for high risk wild mammals uh, and bats you know, we're really going to be really conservative about recommending post-exposure prophylaxis, especially if the animal is unavailable for testing, we consider that high risk. And if we're dealing with the more intermediate risk animals like dogs and cats, we're going to use our other management techniques that we already talked about, such as observing them uh, for a 10-day period or testing them if appropriate. Um, sometimes, uh, depending on level of risk and depending on the situation of the bite, if the animal is unavailable for testing, uh, if it's a stray dog or stray cat, uh, cats you know, probably pose a higher risk in, in Georgia in some ways. If we have a stray cat that bit someone and we are not able to locate it, uh, it, it escaped and animal control is not able to locate the animal, we can't either observe it uh, or test it. If, uh, for that matter, again, sometimes very conservatively, physicians will, will recommend a post-exposure prophylaxis if we don't have an animal uh, to deal with. And then we kind of deal with our kind of lower risk livestock and rodents and legomorphs that we talked about before. So um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, again, about post-exposure prophylaxis uh, recommendations for humans. Jesse covered that. Um, but for the interest of being complete, as part of, again, all of these tiers and these building blocks of rabies prevention, again, Keep in mind that it, it, we do have effective post-exposure prophylaxis available, uh, and the protocol uh, is here, um, again, uh, to, to offer as a key component of rabies prevention once risk is appropriately recognized and assessed that this would be appropriate for treatment. Uh, we talk a little bit about pre-exposure vaccination as well uh, for individuals at high risk. That's one of the other components. Uh, and again, uh, Jesse covered this, so I'll just mention that again, um, mo most of the time when we're talking about pre-exposure vaccination, I concur with Jesse that one of our most common questions is from uh, veterinarians or animal control officers who have, have um, have pre-exposure, uh, have incurred the pre-exposure series, they're previously immunized, and then they encounter a potential rabies exposure and what to do about that. Um, and again, what, and the appropriate answer really is if you have a valid, uh, appropriately risk assessed exposure, uh, they should get a booster, two booster doses of vaccine on day zero and three. Um, but again, oftentimes we get those same questions about whether they should use uh, their, their titers, their uh, anti-rabies antibody titers on that day to determine immune status, but the answer is no. <laughs> so can we, the, one of the themes of our symposium is that rabies, can an old dog do new, new tricks? And we know it can, absolutely. Um, this is a new trick. This is my dog, um, Uncle Warren. Um, he like, when he rides in the car, he can't decide whether he wants to drive, for, see what's going on in the road in front or behind. So he tries to do a little bit of both. But let's talk a little bit about one, one new trick. Uh, and it's not all that new, but again, uh, Jesse mentioned this as well. One of the, it, one of the um, uh, more recent uh, situations that we've encountered um, have been kind of military deployment related rabies. And again, considering the fact that, again, considering the epidemiology of canine rabies and other uh, canine uh, enzootic areas, uh, canine rabies enzootic areas in other countries, uh, this uh, shouldn't really be a surprise. But there have been two, you know, kind of uh, relatively recent published uh, cases of military deployment related rabies. One, the first uh, in 2011 was a U.S. soldier who was uh, stationed uh, in Afghanistan who uh, incurred a dog bite uh, while he was there. And again, um, uh, according to the, the uh, report, uh, he reported it, but he didn't seek medical treatment. Uh, he reported it to his colleagues, and they, they essentially uh, didn't necessarily recognize risk to the point where he sought medical attention, didn't receive post-exposure prophylaxis, and um, uh, was unclear about wound treatment as well uh, up, up front. 
But once he came back uh, from uh, his deployment, it turns out that th three months later, he was back home in New York and went on to develop rabies. And again, um, so, and then in the second case, uh, you know, so very tragic situation with that soldier, and that was really the, the uh, again, the first human rabies case associated with active duty, at least that has been, you know, reported. Um, and in the second case, uh, it wasn't a human case of rabies, but in fact was uh, importation of, of uh, a dog that had been a pet, uh, you know, again, uh, of a, a ser with servicemen who had adopted them in, in Iraq. And again, at this uh, point in time, they brought, the, they brought a whole group of these pets back uh, because the servicemen had, had, had returned back home. And again, one of these, one of these dogs, uh, uh, it was an 11-month-old dog, actually uh, became ill and rabies was diagnosed um, at that time. And again, was a canine variant from the Middle East. So again, these situations are real. They're absolutely real risks. But again, the prevention strategies that surround these kind of tragic scenarios, if we this, again, uh, are, again, are going to be focused on and driven by epidemiology. This is canine rabies and zoetic area. So it's not all that new under the sun. Even though it's a kind of a new trick, uh, as far as rabies goes, the prevention recommendations are, are the same. They're driven by, again, the same type of, of rabies risk awareness. This is a you know, canine rabies area. This, uh, what I wanted to show you here, I kind of can't read it too well, but the military, um, again, uh, as part of the response to the, to the, to the 2011 uh, human rabies case in the soldier, sent this memo and, again, sent this document. Uh, it was, you know, it's publicly available. I could, you can find it online. This is the, from the Department of Defense. It really kind of outlines protocol for how service personnel and military personnel, you know, how exactly what they should do um, again, uh, as far as prevention recommendations, uh, as far as uh, ra animal rabies goes in areas where canine rabies is, is, is prevalent. And so again, it talks about the same thing, ensuring that military personnel uh, have appropriate either pre-exposure immunization, have a protocol in place to report any animal bites, um, prevention of you know, avoidance of, of dogs in these areas, and again, you know, kind of uh, having a protocol in place where they have this risk-based um, post-exposure prophylactic, uh, you know, at least consultation available to them, you know, again, uh, if they were to tell their, their, um, their commanding officer. So again, that, um, again, just wanted to highlight, no matter what, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, what, whatever the wrinkle in the kind of, in the rabies situation, again, the prevention recommendations are really going to be driven by, again, that same, that same tier, all of those building blocks. Uh, I would like to uh, conclude my talk with giving you some resources for us in Georgia. Um, uh, Dr. Julie Gobble is our state public health veterinarian. You'll be hearing from her later in the symposium. Uh, and Melissa Ivey, our rabies epidemiologist, you'll be hearing from her. Uh, later as well. Um, that's my contact information there. And again, we have a, a rabies control manual, as most state health departments do, that again uh, highlights a lot of the things that we just talked about uh, and is again uh, is used very commonly by animal control agencies and um, local health departments in, in Georgia as well. And I will just conclude. This is Uncle Warren. You can get a better cl close up of him. Um, he's not rabid most of the time. And this is E.T. again. He, he's not rabid either, but this one really is. And it's not mine. This, is a, this was a, 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 a rabid cat that uh, was diagnosed in Gwinnett County last year. Uh, again, was, uh, was in somebody's house. Uh, again, uh, a situation I always am pretty fascinated by pictures of, of, of rabid animals. So this one, you know, so here's, here's kind of a clue, but... Oh, strange, strange, but that, that again is a real, a real rabid cat that, I, that, that we saw. And I would like to thank you all for your very kind attention. And I'm, um, if there is time, um, I'm happy to take questions now, but I'll be around for the entire symposium. If you have one that you think of later, you can track me down in the room or, or at lunch, and I'm happy to answer then as well. So, okay, so yes, thank Yes, question. Uh, well, you probably can't uh, make a statement on this, but I practice over in the military areas where Camp, camp Lejeune, and there is a huge problem 
I mean, do we not have enough stray dogs in our own country that they're bringing them over? Because they brought leishmaniasis in when the army brought dogs Absolutely. back, and then they're bringing rabies. I think that dog broke in New New York. New York. Yeah. So was it vaccinated before it was brought over? And you know, and clearly, and again, I think maybe Neil can talk a little bit more about you know CDC. There, so there's military policies, and there's the usual federal, you know, sort of CDC quarantine policies about bringing any animal from other, you know, from other parts of the world here, where they actually, you know, again, have to have appropriate documentation and an appropriate, you know, period of, of quarantine, really. Um, and again, in the military, you know, perhaps again, I think there, there, there really are, from what I could read. I don't have direct knowledge of it. It seems like they are really are trying to crack down on having policies in place for this kind of thing. They recognize the issue. I yeah. just have a really quick comment. Um, Sherry put up the link for the Georgia rabies manual. I just wanted to say that I actually have some of those in my car. If anyone is interested in having a paper copy of that, I'm happy to go and get that at the end of the day. So just grab it. Thank you. Dr. Song? Dr. Um, I would like to differ a little bit in your opinion about the values of um, tigers, you know. Um, I, would, I would argue that we use tigers in human medicine to decide if um, individuals should be revaccinated or not, active, active vaccination. So why don't we accept that for animals, you know, and some vaccine manufacturers would argue that they have good data to prove with, anim with infections, uh, with, with active infections, um, that um, you know some of the products um, um, provided tigers to prevent you know, um, infection. You know, three, seven, three or seven, up to seven years after these individuals had the vaccine. So why do you say there are different standards between animals? And no. No. What I what I said was actually is that again it depends. You know, the, so so the the. T tighter testing, again, as far as these are sort of national recommendations from the, the national compendium that, again, that an individual titer, again, should not be used as a, a management tool to indicate absolute immunity at that time. So, again, it's more of looking at if in the testing is going to be different. It's the way the test is done. And, and Jesse, help me with this too. Can you, um, as far as, like, for example, if you're talking about a person that has had pre exposure, a pre exposure series, and they have it, you know, and again, it's recommended according to, again, according to national recommendations that, that you know, veterinarians, people at high risk, every, um, you know, every few years have their tighter run and they can tell whether or not they need a booster dose. That is, that is done. That again is because you're sort of looking at it over time, immunity over time. But again, as far as uh, the point being is that as an in, and it, there's not necessarily, you know, kind of this, this snapshot, you know, single level of titer that's going to indicate absolute immunity to because of the other, because of the other potential immune factors that are involved. Jesse, do you have anything else to add? 